On today's episode of You Asked, the contrast enhancer setting on TVs, yay or nay? Why are 83 inch OLEDs so much more expensive than 77 inch OLEDs? How do you know if you're getting a 10 bit panel on your TV? Is TV brightness about to hit a power wall? And sound treatments versus auto EQ, which should come first? Welcome back everyone, I'm Caleb Dennison and this is You Asked, the show where I answer questions you asked in hopes that I can help you and others with similar tech questions. If you've got a question for me, please email it to youasked at digitaltrends.com and we'll see if your question gets picked to be answered on the show. I am super stoked to be back from vacation and wow, a lot of questions came into the You Asked inbox. So I did my best to handpick those which I thought would be of the most interest on the show this week. Let me know how I did uh, by the end of this video. With that in mind, we'll start with a question from Isaiah Noreen who asks, should contrast enhancer be turned on or off with Samsung TVs? Now, Isaiah, I doubt this was intentional on your part, but the wording that you used, specifically the word should, has the potential to make this a loaded question, which necessarily makes for a loaded answer. Here's my short answer. You, Isaiah, should turn contrast enhancer on if you like the way the picture looks better than when the feature is turned off. And if you don't like the way it looks, then don't turn it on. Now see, if you're a purist and you want to see the content looking as close as possible to how the creators intended it to look, then you should watch in a dark room with the TV's picture mode set to filmmaker mode or IMAX enhanced or movie slash cinema mode where the brightness and contrast levels are gonna be set in such a way that the content is supposed to look the way it was created to look when you watch it in a dark room. And this reminds me, I just did a video about filmmaker mode, so check that video out if this topic interests you. However, if you are less interested in what the creator intended, and instead you have a preference for a bright, punchy picture that technically strays away from measurable accuracy, and you find that contrast enhancer gets you closer to the picture that you crave, then by all means, use it. Now, I will say that sometimes engaging a post-processing feature like contrast enhancer can create unintended side effects like noise or posterization, raised black levels in some areas, or even lost bright highlights in HDR. It depends on the TV brand and even the models within that brand, in this case, Samsung. So you may find yourself having to make a concession when you turn on contrast enhancer. But the bottom line is the vast majority of TV watchers are, I think, less concerned with the notion of accuracy and standards than they are with a picture that just looks great to their eyes. So watch some content you like, watch some SDR content, some HDR content, and toggle contrast enhancer on and off while you watch. And if you like the way the picture looks with it turned on, use it. And try to understand that anyone who says it's a mistake to use a feature like contrast enhancer probably comes from a place where their priorities are different than yours. What matters is that you are happy. So see if Contrast Enhancer makes you happy or not and let that guide your decision. Rick Hall writes, why is the 83 inch OLED priced so much more than the 77 inch? The price jump from 65 to 77 isn't as bad, even though it's a larger screen upgrade in calculated screen area. Thank you, Rick. And I totally understand why you might be baffled. I think we have a tendency to think that pricing should be linear or proportional, that we should be able to break down a TV's cost per inch of screen real estate and then extrapolate what a TV should cost based on that number. But as you've discovered, that is very much not the case. And there are two primary reasons why, based on what I've learned over the years of being in retail and speaking to these TV brands. When it comes to luxury goods, the more premium the product, the more profit margin is gonna be built in. The price increase is not proportionate to the cost of production increase. Like if we compare a Toyota Highlander to a Lexus RX, you'll find that they are very similar vehicles in many foundational ways. 
But even as you add similar trim options and goodies to each model, the Lexus RX is not only always going to be more expensive, but the upgrades are increasingly expensive. Thus, the price gap of the base models for each car may be, let's just make up a number, $10,000 but the price gap between the fully loaded models might be closer to like $30,000. Now I'm making those numbers up just for illustration, but hopefully that makes sense. The more premium a product is considered to be, the more profit margin is gonna be built in. You can sell five units of a less expensive model to make say 40% profit, or you can sell just one of the premium model to make that same 40% profit. But there's also a more practical reason. OLED TV panels are cut from one large piece of panel glass, and we call that mother glass. And the larger the panel you cut for first, the fewer TVs, monitors, or phone screens that you can make out of what's left over. So while you may be able to make two 65-inch OLED TVs and six 32-inch ultra-wide OLED monitors out of just one piece of mother glass, that's eight products, you don't end up with a whole lot of cuttable glass left over if you cut a big old 83 inch OLED TV panel out of that same mother glass. You might be able to get a couple of 32 inch monitors at best. Now, since you're making fewer products out of that one sheet, you're gonna have to make up for the cost. So jack up the price. Reshub K writes, is there any true 10 bit panel in any commercially selling TV? Or is everyone just using 8-bit plus FRC, which by the way stands for frame rate control? Why do the official sites of many TV brands not mention this specifically? Yeah, so I wanna say just about every 4K OLED TV these days has a native 10-bit panel. And many, if not most, premium LCD TVs do as well. I think the reason why this isn't a specification that brands are more transparent about that to me is a mystery, though I would speculate that a big part of it is that it could cause more confusion for more folks than it actually helps. That said, I could make confirming the native bit depth of a TV panel a part of my reviews going forward. Like I could just make getting panel information a core part of the review process and toss it in the numbers for nit nerds section. Is it VA, IPS, or ADS? Is it 10-bit or 8-bit plus FRC, etc.? I don't think that would be adding too much time or effort, so if enough of you want it, I'll just start doing it. Let me know down in the comments. Leon Wynn writes, will a TV's brightness eventually be limited by power from the wall? I'd imagine when TVs start hitting 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 nits full 100% window, it could start tripping some breakers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a cool question and I see why you're asking it. I would say that the use of capacitors, similar to how they're used in audio systems that provide a big short boost in power when needed, that could help a TV get brighter than the constant 120 volt, 15 or 20 amp circuits that are in a US home would typically allow. With that said, I have no idea what the current limit would be. That would take some calculating that I think might be beyond my capability, but if we have any electrical engineers out there watching, would you weigh in in the comments? And we might have to follow this one up in a future episode. Phyllis and Brian Kelleher write, our Sony Bravia XDL 46 XBR2 LCD TV just finally died. We would get the black screen of death, but we're able to several times unplug it overnight and it would turn on in the morning and work fine for several weeks. But alas, we think it finally passed away today. Our dilemma is what Sony to buy now. Our room has a sliding door, four large windows, two skylights, and an adjacent room with eight windows, all receiving east-southeast light. So I am now confused as to whether to look at a mini LED or an OLED model. Your input would help us a great deal in making that decision this weekend, hoping for the Memorial Day sales to help. Well guys, I'm sorry that I missed the Memorial Day opportunity. I was on vacation myself, but I think I can still help you out if you haven't already bought a TV. So Phyllis and Brian, there's a lot about your viewing habits that I don't know, and having that information would help me to give you better advice. But I'm gonna take some wild guesses here. Given all your windows and the light that I imagine comes pouring in, plus the possibility that you, like many folks in the US, probably have your TV on for five or more hours per day, 
I'm gonna say that I think you guys are probably gonna do best with a mini LED LCD TV. Memorial Day has passed, but you can still get a great deal on a TV. And actually, I suggest sticking with Sony, since you wanna do that, but also because I think it's the best option for you. Look at the 2023 Sony X90L or X95L. Both of those TVs will offer a dramatic improvement in picture quality over your recently deceased TV. May it rest in peace. They're both gorgeous models, brighter than you've had before and more colorful as well. Most importantly though, the overall look of the TV is gonna feel familiar since you're staying in the Sony family. Steven Pythian writes, I'm about to set up my theater room and I'm trying to figure out which comes first, the sound treatments, then Dirac, or run Dirac, then the sound treatments, then run Dirac again. I had a study done of my room acoustics by Vicoustic, letting me know what kind of sound treatments I would need, so I have those on hand. Hey Steven, easy answer, always, always, always sound treatments first. Trying to overcome physical acoustic issues with sound processing is a tough enough job already. Take care of your room first. This will give Dirac, which by the way, for those of you who don't know, is like an auto EQ and uh, room compensation system. This will give Dirac less trouble uh, to try to iron out. And I suspect leave it to do an even better job with what's left. Thanks as always for watching everyone. What did you think of today's episode? Were any specific answers of particular help to you? Let me know down in the comments. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I'll see you on the next one. And until then, here's two other videos I think you might like.